Today, we are joined by Hadar Cohen. Your profile caught my attention as one of the Jewish anti-Zionist voices from on the ground in Palestine. Part of what happened under Zionism is that Judaism was kind of taken and made into this racialized hierarchy. And there all of a sudden was like this Jewish supremacy. So a lot of the Jewish communities that were Arab and were part of the region, like just got completely fragmented. As I was coming into my anti-Zionist identity, one of the things that I was feeling was that my Jewish ancestors were like strongly supporting that. A lot of times the colonial project wants to keep certain stories and erase other ones, and then it gets captured in history books. And that means that you have to actually reject the way that Zionism has taught you about Judaism. Nobody does anti-Semitism like Zionists. It's the only <laughs> thing that they should go to the Olympics for. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 21 of the Palestine Pod, the weekly podcast where we break down the latest headlines dealing with Palestine from all over the world and bring you stories, commentary, and interviews with the aim of spreading awareness about the Palestinian struggle for justice and equal rights. I'm one of your hosts, Lara E. You might know me from Instagram as at Gazan Girl, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mikey B. What's up, y'all? Mikey B on TikTok, Michael Scherzer on Instagram, and Mikey Intifada, if you think God gave you the land of Palestine, but you don't even believe in God. That is a classic Zionist situation. So before we get into today's episode, please like, comment, and subscribe if you hang out with us on YouTube. And if you're listening on a podcast app, subscribe and leave a review if you can. As always, you can find our full episodes and sources on palestinepod.com. And if you want to get involved in the conversation, reach out to us at palestinepod at gmail.com and give us a follow on Instagram at the Palestine Pod. Today, we are joined by Hadar Cohen. Hadar is a feminist multimedia artist, healer, and educator. She's originally from Jerusalem with lineage from Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Palestine. Hadar is a Jewish mystic who works to build decolonial frameworks for worshiping God. Her artistic mediums include performance, movement, writing, weaving, sound, and ritual. Hadar, welcome to the Palestine Pod. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Adar, your profile caught my attention within the context of the global intifada of unity as one of the Jewish anti-Zionist voices from on the ground in Palestine. You have previously written about how your family has been in Palestine for over 10 generations. Can you first start by telling our listeners a little bit about your family's history and how and when they arrived in Palestine? Yeah, sure. So first of all, I was born in Jerusalem and I grew up with just like such a deep love for the land and for the city. Like everything in my family was always about Jerusalem. Like we were always just obsessed with it. And my grandparents both were born in Jerusalem from my dad's side and they grew up in the old city. And from my grandma's side, you know, that's kind of the line that dates all the way back to 10 generations. Before that, they were coming from Syria, from Aleppo. And before that, they were in Spain. So from the expulsion of Spain, they kind of traveled through Greece into Syria. And then they kind of intermarried with the indigenous community there. And then they moved to Jerusalem. And then I was born from there. We grew up with a mixture of like Halabi, like Aleppo lineage mixed with like a Jerusalemite lineage. Yeah, very much identify as a Jerusalemite. Being in Palestine for over 10 generations, your family arrived there and lived there for, for quite a long time before Zionism. Yeah. So I wonder how your family reacted to events like the emergence of Zionism, the Nakba, the establishment of the state of Israel. Was it something where they immediately got sort of swept into this new Israeli identity and became a part of it only then later to, you know, have sort of a, an awakening that perhaps Zionism was not the answer or was there resistance from the beginning? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think you can actually see this with a lot of like Mizrahi communities, Jews coming from Middle Eastern countries and just how the shifts across generations happen. Like 
for my grandparents' generation, I think that there was a lot of disorientation and confusion. And, you know, I talk about this a lot too around Judaism, because part of what happened under Zionism is that Judaism was kind of taken and made into this racialized, like, hierarchy. And there all of a sudden was like this Jewish supremacy. So a lot of the Jewish communities that were Arab and were part of the region, like, just got completely fragmented. And I think for my grandparents, that was like a very disorienting experience. And I remember growing up with stories, especially from my grandma, you know, I think she was maybe like 10 during 67 when Jerusalem was captured. So just like these, these really intense stories of all of a sudden having to realize that like, okay, like all of a sudden these people that you grew up with are made to be your enemy. It's just really like strong confusion. But even until the day of her death, my grandma was very involved in Palestinian community and like stayed in touch with a lot of, a lot of her friends. And actually, you know, it's really funny because my grandpa passed away when I was very young, when I was five, and my grandma passed away about two years ago. And she was a painter and she has this amazing painting that she did of my grandpa. So before she died, everybody in the family was kind of like, who's going to get this painting? And she ended up just giving it to one of her Palestinian friends, like not Mm. even in the family. (laughs) And we're all like, what? Like, I wanted that painting. Um, But I think that just kind of speaks to how, you know, that was such a big part of her life and also just like that cultural and ancestral memory. I think for my parents' generation, it was a little bit different because they kind of grew up under Zionism. And, you know, I think not everybody, you know, when you are, when you grow up under such an intense ideology, you don't necessarily have the power and the courage to examine it, especially if you are dealing with a lot of erasure and trauma. And I think my parents just yeah, they just kind of like accepted Zionist ideology and they just kind of embedded into it. And for me, I think I grew up with a lot of confusion because I it was really hard to kind of separate like, okay, like what is the propaganda? What is happening in my family? How is, you know, my grandparents' lineage and my parents' lineage, like how are their experiences different and, and what is my experience? So you know, everything was happening so fast here across the generations. But I definitely still have this, you know, ancestral memory that I feel like I carry from my grandma. I was very close to her. She was, you know, what like my mom. So even though she passed away, I feel like I've inherited these, you know, pre Zionist memories of Jerusalem that are very close to my heart. I'm filled with grief about it, because it's like, I don't know if we're ever going to have that back. You know, folks, especially around my grandma's age, are dying. Those memories are continuing to be lost. I think a lot about, like, what does it look like to revive the history of Jerusalem specifically from that ancestral memory? I think that's part of what my work is here. Would you say then that you're the first generation after the emergence of Zionism that has identified and come out strongly as an anti Zionist? In my family, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. In Masood Hayoun's When We Were Arabs, he says, quote, memory can subvert colonial authority. It can frighten the colonizers because it allows us to reconfigure this miserable world we live in now, depose the white supremacist, topple his statue in the public square and approach the European sector with open eyes, ready to disassemble empire. This is one of the reasons the stories you shared are so important and so impactful. Can you speak about how simply remembering and retelling your family history poses a threat to the colonial apartheid regime? Yeah, what a wonderful question. So I think first to just unpack what this word memory is, because it's quite complex, and I actually approach it from a psychological and spiritual perspective as well. And for me, memory, you know, it's, it's carried through the body, it's also carried through the land, and it's also carried through the ancestors. So a lot of times, you know, the colonial project wants to keep certain stories and erase other ones, and then it gets captured in history books and, you know, narrative and all of that. But our bodies actually are, you know, a living testimony to that resistance. Just the fact that we still have breath flowing through us means that we have, you know, a decolonial memory somewhere inside. So a lot of my work as a performance artist is to reignite those 
spaces of memory through the body. And, you know, even if sometimes we don't necessarily have the memory that we would have liked, you know, from the history books or from the archives or from all of these other lenses, there's something that is really beautiful about, you know, the kind of more mysterious ways um, in which memory and then specifically ancestral memory gets passed on. And, and, you know, I feel that quite strongly, especially from, I think I, you know, as I was coming into my anti-Zionist identity, one of the things that I was feeling really strongly was that my Jewish ancestors were like strongly supporting that. And I remember it was like so confusing for me because it went against everything I was kind of taught in Jewish day schools or, you know, even in American Jewish institutions that it's like, okay, to be Jewish and Zionism is like linked. And all of a sudden I was like doing all these communion practices with my ancestors and they were, they were like free Palestine all the way. And it was so disorienting for me because I was like, wait, what? And then I learned that I actually would rather trust my ancestors stories that they're kind of directly teaching me through this memory line than you know kind of the the institutional memory that has a very specific agenda to me that is like a big decolonial project of you know kind of working with the body to return back to those memories and just a follow-up question you mentioned that your father also went through somewhat of a political reawakening where he realized that Zionists had severely misled Arab Jews. If you're comfortable talking about it, would you just share what that journey was like for him and how it's impacted your family at large? Yeah. So, you know, I think with my parents, it's been this interesting relationship because I've always tried to kind of push back against their Zionist ideology and and, you know, show them different perspectives and kind of push them a little bit. And I think that, you know, it's really easy to see their trauma kind of playing out as they're speaking to me. And especially, you know, that Mizrahi trauma, especially my mom kind of carries this a lot where this really like internalized narrative that like being Arab is being bad and being Arab is being stupid or is being kind of like low class or unenlightened or all these things. So I think my parents like definitely try to kind of do everything they could to just like shut off the Arabness within them. And I think my dad, like after my grandma passed, um, went through this whole awakening where he was like, wait, I didn't really realize that this Israeli project is actually destroying my whole lineage. And I think it really took my grandma's death to kind of awaken him in that level. And I think it's multidimensional, right? It's like the history, but it's also like the culture and the traditions and, you know, especially also like the Jewish Arab traditions. I think that there's a huge, huge loss there. And, you know, I, I put a lot of energy also into that cultural revival work, you know, whether it's like the music or the prayer or the traditions, there's a huge loss in erasure. And I think that as my dad has also become more spiritual and more kind of connected to tradition, he's become like he started realizing more and more how like the Judaism that is conveyed in Israel is like very largely European. And yeah, so I think he's kind of tried this like cultural resistance project of like, okay, well, what does it look like to like return to the teachings of Judaism, of like Kabbalah, of Jewish Arab music, of all these places. And And that means that you have to actually reject the way that Zionism has taught you about Judaism. Totally. On the the pod, we talk a lot about physical colonization, right? Stealing land, cutting access to resources, demolishing houses, restricting movement, etc. But we don't often talk about the colonization of the mind, right? Such that some Jews from Iraq, Tunisia, embrace the idea that they are somehow superior. They try to distance themselves from anything Arab, as you've mentioned, including their own features, which often resemble that of our Palestinian cousins. Can you talk about colonization of the mind and give any examples you see daily? Yeah. So I think during the recent escalation of violence, I think I saw this most clearly, where you start realizing that, you know, there is 
obviously a physical war, there's physical displacement and colonization and all of that. But a lot of the ways that it's being enacted, it's through control of the mind and it's through perpetuation of certain narratives. And you can actually see that it's pretty influential. Like it's, it has a very strong hold on people. And I think I was starting to observe just okay, like, how are people thinking? What are people paying attention to? Like, what are they conditioned to even see or not see? And, and, and really thinking about like, how does the mind work? And so living in the States for many years, and part of racial justice movements there. And I think I was also very inspired by the conversations about decolonizing that extend into you know, the the personal realm and into the levels of the mind. And I, you know, I'm also like a spiritual practitioner. So for me, I find that when we work from the inside and when we learn to shift and transform our own workings of our mind and, and learn that we can actually, we can resist, you know, the the narrative that's coming at us and choose to see something differently. Like to me, that's really huge levels of power. And when we can train people to do that, to me, that's when, you know, systems begin to crumble. So a lot of my work is also around this educational work around decolonizing and, and teaching people that just, you know, you can do it through your body. It's like, yeah, sometimes you can show up to the action or to the protest and all of that. But you can also just do it with yourself and the way that you think and, and, and see the ways that you were shaped to think and, and start investigating why and, and, and taking on different perspectives and seeing seeing what it looks like from from different angles. I want to read just from one of your stories about Zionism. You went on a little bit of a rant about what Zionism is, and I found it so perfectly worded that I think it merits just for me to put it out there and then see if you have any reactions or if you want to elaborate. So you wrote, okay, so now on to Zionism. European Jews came to Palestine and were like, let's create a state. But they were greatly outnumbered by the Palestinians. So they were like, hmm, this won't work. How about we trick and manipulate Jews from the Middle East to come join this colonial project and we will basically use them to colonize. Zionist leaders went to all these Middle Eastern cities and basically convinced them to come join, saying that this is a religious project and it's the time to come to the Holy Land. They promised them all these things, but when they got to the land, they were demeaned and oppressed in many ways. Zionists placed these communities in cities and villages right near the Palestinians so that the European Jews wouldn't interface with Palestinians. They basically used them to occupy as border cities without telling them this. You also went on and you explained how European Zionists made it very clear in their writings that Jews from the Middle East are a racialized other. They called them barbaric and uneducated and never viewed them as equals Jewishly. You said that Zionism created a paradigm of false Jewish unity and created the Arab as the enemy, meaning now we have a war between Jews and Arabs. But this framing drives me nuts because it is so misleading and it's the Zionist frame. It's essential that we decolonize our minds as we work towards liberation. The state of Israel is created on a racial hierarchy where Arab is the other slash enemy slash the one that must be destroyed, but not fully because we psychologically need them there so we can continue oppressing them. And Jewish is the upper status, which really means European Jews and thus Jewish fascism is born. I was like, chills. <laughs> I read that wow, I was like, whoa. Well. It was, I mean, it's just in an Instagram story, but it's the whole story. It's summed up in like, in like two slides. <laughs> yeah, it was funny, you know, on Instagram, it's like all of a sudden I was getting all these followers and I realized I had all these things to say. And even writing those posts, it's like, I just felt like there was so much information for me. I, I was just kind of like channeling really fast and I wasn't even editing and it just kind of came out. And it was really beautiful to see so many people resonating with that. I think a lot of people resonated. I mean, for me as a Palestinian, the reason it resonates with me is because what you're doing is you're sort of uncovering this Jewish identity pre-Zionism that, you know, where we were never at odds with one another. We were brothers and sisters, and that's a beautiful thing. And that deserves to be reclaimed. And there's nothing the good that comes out of Zionism, right? Zionism is racism. Zionism is, you know, a colonial project. Zionism is apartheid. It's all of those things. And if we can manage to create a world without Zionism, I think there is so much that we stand to gain. 
living in this multicultural, multi-religious community in Palestine. And, and, and that's to me what liberation looks like. I mean, oftentimes I think Zionists may not really even understand what liberation looks like, what, what a free Palestine actually looks like. They don't realize that if they just change their worldview a little bit, that if they were actually about acceptance and, and loving their brother and sister, that they would have a space in Palestine. What doesn't have a space in Palestine is exclusionary politics, is racial hierarchies, is supremacy. That's what doesn't have a space in Palestine. But yeah. everything that you wrote resonates with me because it harkens to a time that existed before that I hope will exist again, where something really beautiful can happen between all these different identities and cultures. Yeah, Lara often shares that her grandfather grew up next to a Jewish family, next to a Christian family, and they were, of course, a Muslim family, and they all lived in peace before Zionism. And I think what's so powerful about what you shared is that Zionism predicates on splintering your identity, making you choose between either being Arab or Jewish. But what you said is, I will not dim my light to suit the purposes of a colonial power. I am both Arab and Jewish, and I reject that framework entirely. I don't even have a question. I just want to commend you and uh, <laughs> holding space for that type of conversation and all the work that you're doing. I admire you very much. Thank you. Thanks. I really appreciate that. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's been years of just being in an internal process of healing with myself because for so long, I felt so fragmented. And I felt like my identity didn't make any sense to the world. I mean, even in the States, I'm in a lot of multi faith communities. And, you know, every time I show up, it's like the narrative of what it means to be Jewish. It's like, oh, it's like European, and you do all these traditions. And I'm like, no, I don't do any of that. So even just, you know, interacting in the States with other communities, I'm, I'm like learning how solidified this like, Jewish equals Ashkenazi European equation has become. And to me, I think that's a great, great loss. And, you know, I want to talk a little bit about Jewish trauma and the way that Jewish trauma works, because, you know, I've, I also work a lot with doing a lot of teachings about anti-Semitism in the multi-faith space and working with Jewish trauma and understanding that. And I think that one of the things that makes me really angry is just the way that anti-Semitism is being weaponized by Zionism and and actually, like, weirdly makes the Jewish trauma claim, like, less real. And it makes me angry because I'm like, no, 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 I actually want to talk about Jewish trauma. And I want to talk about it with the rest of the world. But the Zionism actually, like, doesn't allow that to happen. And I think that especially kind of the European-based Jewish trauma kind of has this narrative that, okay, like, Jews aren't safe in the world, like, no place for us. The, everybody hates us. No one will ever understand our narrative, you know, that kind of lens. So, so they kind of, you know, block out the rest of the world. And you can see that in the Zionist ideology, a way that Israel kind of constantly is like, well, the world doesn't understand us, so we can just do whatever we want. And we don't have to ha be accountable to anyone because we come from all this pain. So, you know, it's a, it's the weaponization of that trauma. But for me, as an Arab Jew, you know, and I think I wrote about this in my story, too, one of the things that I love about being Arab is that it actually is about being interconnected with so many other communities and so many other tribes. And, and I want to fight for Jewish people being part of the world, not being isolated from the world, which I think that the Zionist ideology, you know, as it perpetuates this notion of like Jewish safety, Actually, the safety that it's talking about is like, okay, well, let's isolate the rest, the Jews from the rest of the world so that there's no accountability, there's no conversations, there's no anything. And, you know, we can kind of do whatever we want. But I think this Arab Jewish identity really kind of takes it, shatters that whole paradigm apart because, you know, for me and my family, it's kind of like, no, you don't understand. Like, we actually did belong to the Middle East. We actually, like, do come from these lands. We actually felt really connected with, you know, Muslim and Christian and Baha'i folks here. Like, and I, I think that, you know, I want to be in the type of world where Judaism is a part of the world and not kind of separated out from the world. And I think that that is going to require a lot of trauma healing work to kind of shift that narrative. 
but I do feel that, you know, this Arab Jewish identity, the more that I, it's, it's really, you know, it's just with the escalation of violence. I remember speaking with one of my healers and I was just like, I feel like I'm irrelevant here. Like, I don't even know nobody, like, what is my identity here? Even it makes no sense. Like, I just felt like I don't even know how to plug in where like to show up. I remember in Jerusalem, you know, there was two different protests that were happening. There was like the Israeli protests and then the Palestinian protests in Sheikh Jarrah. And I was like kind of caught in between. And I was just like, where, like, who do I even protest? Like, how do I show up right now? Both that- protesting for the same side, right? Just different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just everybody just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was like the, uh, yeah, eventually they actually kind of combined and they really like, the Israelis marched from West Jerusalem towards East Jerusalem. And then there was like this beautiful, like protest that would happen on Friday afternoons. But for a while, especially in the beginning, they were like kind of separated out. Uh, All of the protests were against the occupation and yeah, free Palestine protests. (laughs) For sure. And thanks for making that distinction, huh? I want to... Just touch on something you were saying about how Zionists will use anti-Semitism and sort of weaponize Jewish trauma in the process. A lot of the messages that I get that are anti-Semitic come from Zionists. I would say like most of them, honestly. Nobody does anti-Semitism like Zionists. It's the only <laughs> thing that they should go to the Olympics for. It's, <laughs> it's, like, a, it's like a pastime for them, honestly. Can you speak about how that will and does in the long run diminish actual claims of anti-Semitism and make people skeptical of even talking about anti-Semitism because it becomes so associated with this weaponization that people are sort of like, oh, it's the boy who cried wolf. Yeah, it's pretty horrible. I don't know that I have much to say. I mean, the comments that, yeah, I also get a lot of just like hate messages, largely from Israelis or, you know, yeah, like Zionists. And I remember this one person messaged me and they were like, oh, the reason why you're getting all these followers and, you know, like the Arab world is like accepting you is because you're hiding your Jewishness. And they like wrote me all these paragraphs of the way that I'm hiding my Jewishness. And I was like, have you read my profile? (laughs) Like, what? (laughs) That's not what I'm doing at all. It was just like so confusing to receive. And and I think it just kind of speak, like I just saw that message and I was just like, this is clearly not based on anything. It's just like a reiteration of some weird narrative and it's not actually grounded in reality. I think one thing that was also really funny is that I had a couple of Israelis that like started this campaign kind of against me and they were like, report her to Instagram. She's a terrorist, like all of these things. And the thing that I found the most uh, hilarious was this woman, like she went before I even did any of these stories. I have a story like from, I don't know, a year ago where I talked about being Arab and she literally like screenshotted that and was just like, see, this woman is Arab. She's pretending to be Jewish. We have to take her down. And I was just like, okay, first of all, you can be Arab and Jewish. And second of all, like that mindset of just like, oh, well, if she's Arab, then she's evil and must be destroyed kind of. <laughs> it's really hard. Sometimes I kind of want to publicize these comments that I get because I think people don't really understand like how baseless these claims are it does you know a little bit drive me crazy as someone who is very committed to you know teaching the world about anti-semitism and and i am part of a lot of you know multiracial, multi-faith communities working in solidarity and i see jewish communities being definitely a part of that but but then i see you know what i was seeing also kind of in the states a lot of my friends in the states messaged me and they're like thank you so much for speaking up because I don't exactly know what to say. And I have, I say one thing and all of a sudden I get all these anti-Semitic claims and I care about Jewish people and I don't even know how to orient it. So I started feeling that it's really important for me as a Jewish person to speak up because, you know, these claims of anti-Semitism just come rushing in to anybody who speaks up. And I think that if you're Jewish and speaking up, like, it has a little bit more weight because you're like, no. And especially for me, I'm just like, I've literally done years of work around anti-Semitism. So it's just, you know, those claims just don't have any base. And I think the more we expose that, 
hopefully the healthier we all become. Totally. I've received thousands of messages along the same lines, anywhere from calling me a capo to undermining my Jewishness. I just want to thank you for, for sharing that. Because one of the things that like, it used to really affect me, honestly, I really was impacted by all of the messages. And now I eat them for breakfast. You know what I'm saying? It's like, um, um, like <laughs> come for me if you want. Just like what you said, they're so far removed from reality. It's sort of like a student who hasn't read the text and they're trying to answer the questions. And it's like, no, you don't, you're not even plugged in. That wasn't in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Embarrassing. <laughs> Literally any iteration of the book, not there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I think that it's like, I want to get to the place where you are, where you eat it for breakfast, because it does still affect me sometimes because my Jewish identity is so important to me. So sometimes I'm like, like when I got that comment about me hiding my Jewishness, I'm like, am I hiding my Jewishness? But it was just so silly because all the other messages I was receiving were like, thank you for, you know, showing your Jewishness. So yeah, it's, it's, I think that's like the more that we publicly talk about it, a lot of times people think that it's like, okay, well, if you private message people and if you kind of like make it all this way or like, you know, personally attack them, like, but we're obviously stronger together. And the more that these kind of cases come out, it just weakens the Zionist case more and more. Yeah, Zionists want people to believe that all Jews everywhere support Israel, right? And that's just yeah. not the case. Straight up, that is not the case. It is a fiction. Yeah. And people like you, people like me, we are breaking down these walls, these mental walls that they've built one brick at a time. Yeah. And, you know, I think they just did a new study. One in four Jews in the United States agree that Israel is an apartheid state. And that is, I guess, good news because it's better than it was before. But looking at that statistic another way, it means that three out of four Jews in the United States don't live in reality. Yeah, you know, I was actually kind of seeing this a little bit differently. I was like, okay, one in four American Jews feel like they can publicly say that. Like, mm. for me, my experience in being in Jewish community, and especially being outspoken, like I get a lot of messages from other Jews being like, thank you so much for speaking out, like, I'm too scared to. And I think that that's another kind of story that's not told is just how much of a weight Zionism has on Jewish communities and how much silencing actually happens there too and gaslighting and all of these things. And I think that, you know, it takes a really long process as a Jewish person to feel like you can come out as an anti-Zionist Jew. It like almost needs to be like this coming out party. Um, yeah. And I think, <laughs> I think that there are actually a lot of other Jews who do feel aligned, but they actually just haven't made that step to be public yet. And I see that especially with like in the Arab Jewish community that, you know, I think that there are a lot of anti-Zionist ideology there, but there's so much fear about speaking up. So then it's only kind of talked about inside in communities. And, you know, a lot of my work is also like, okay, well, how do we actually do the like Mizrahi Palestinian solidarity work so that we can feel braver about taking more political risks and actually like standing in solidarity and speaking up. But I think the fear is really, really big. So I think that is also part of this narrative that, you know, Zionism is also harmful to Jewish people. It takes a long time to decondition yourself from Zionism. To those Jews who are still on the apartheid fence, jump in and the water's warm. You know, there's a lot of Palestinians that maybe don't even speak out and aren't activists, especially in, 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 in exile. It's a choice, right? It's a choice that you take and with it comes a certain cost and a certain risk. My parents were not activists. They were refugees and first generation immigrants to the United States, arriving here, having had their political asylum application accepted, fleeing the Gulf War in Kuwait in the early 90s, and being expelled for the second time in a couple of generations from where they were living. And the only thing on their mind was, how do we take care of our kids? Like it was a one track mind to how do we just survive? Being an activist wasn't even a question. That was almost like a luxury. And 
for me, I, I sort of see it that way where it's like, well, now I have a passport. Okay. So I don't have to worry about that. You know, I have a passport. So now I can be an activist because I've reached a certain level of stability and comfort that I can now use my time to focus on these causes and absorb whatever negative repercussions are going to come my way. And, you know, the hateful messages and, you know, the, the Zionists flooding your inbox and, and all of that and the threats, it's heavy and it can weigh on you. And I too would like to get to the place where Michael is at, where, you know, he's just all in. <laughs> yeah. It, it requires a lot of mental strength and probably a lot of therapy. And I'm not there yet, but shout out to my therapist. He's Palestinian. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's amazing. But I do think it is a choice. And I do understand, Hadar, what you're saying about people who maybe have these feelings internally, but have not vocalized them yet. Because not everybody is a public speaker. Not everybody is this fiery activist that is ready to have their coming out. You have spoken about how people have a responsibility to dethrone dictatorship and to undo racial systems of oppression wherever they are. I agree with you. I think for a lot of people, taking the stage and making public statements may not be their way to contribute. So they might be contributing in other ways. But I do think it is important that we at least work towards building this courage so that one day we're at least on a path to getting able to defend legitimate causes, causes of liberation, like the Palestinian cause for liberation. And I encourage anybody who is unsure or maybe has these feelings but hasn't vocalized them yet just to keep studying to keep learning because i promise you that zionists are weak they are weak their ideology is weak it's built on nothing and it hasn't existed for the large part of jewish history so please understand that you know for thousands and thousands of years there's this thing called judaism and zionism was not a part of it and so if you're a Jewish person that is grappling with this, or if you're just you know, a non-Jewish person, but is trying to understand how Zionism fits into this whole thing, please understand that it is brand new. It has nothing to do with the prophets, peace be upon them all, and the messengers of God. And it has created an absolutely egregious system of injustice in Palestine. And that is something that we should care about, especially for American, especially for American because we pay for it. So just a call to action to anybody who's still a little bit, you know, unsure. And since we also brought up therapy, you know, I think that something that sometimes people think they can do is just, okay, like I'll work on my personal problems and then the collective issues are just kind of there outside of me. But I think that in a lot of my work is also just showing how that's actually an illusion and the personal is political. So even just as we're working on ourselves, like it's impossible to not interact with a political struggle. So yeah, not everybody needs to be a public speaker, do Instagram lives every day, but everybody has to kind of investigate how their role in the collective is and how they're personally like tied in in that. And part of the personal healing work is actually showing up for that collective and especially around like systems, undoing systems of racial justice and decolonizing you know to me i feel like it's it's a global necessity at this point like if we're all not invested in decolonization it's like what else are we doing with our time you know like to me that's like the only project that is actually like useful right now because a the stakes are so high and b i think that's just what's being called of us so there's many avenues to enter but we all have to enter somehow could have said it better myself. And that's why we invited you. <laughs> so speaking about the way that Ashkenazis shoehorned themselves into the region and established a political apparatus to reinforce this caste system. In 2018, 31.8% of Israeli Jews self-identify as Ashkenazi, in addition to 24 being immigrants from the former USSR, a majority of whom self-identify as Ashkenazi. Basically, every president and PM since 48 has been an Ashkenazi Jew. At the same time, Ethiopian Jews are sterilized, brutalized by the police, 
other African Jews have been deported, and Arab Jews face discrimination. They don't earn as much. They don't have the same access or opportunities as their Ashkenazi counterparts. How is it that a people who came from another place make up a minority of the social demographics, control the politics of the majority, and yet still consider themselves, quote unquote, diverse? That's a great question. You know, I remember Thank one you. time I... <laughs> I do this. I was, <laughs> yeah. When I was kind of processing a lot of my trauma with one of my non Jewish healers in the Bay Area, I was just, you know, talking a lot of Mizrahi trauma and all of this. And he just had no idea about any of it. And he's like, what is going on? And I remember he was kind of like to me, wait, Jews are oppressing other Jews? Like, in Israel? And like, nobody's talking about this? Like, I feel like the world doesn't know. And then I remembered like having this moment, I was like, oh yeah, the world really doesn't know because it's like everything has been kind of covered in this blanket statement of like, okay, Israeli, Zionist, Jews. And I think that highlighting all these various struggles of Ethiopian Jews, of Arab Jews, in my lens, this is part of the Zionist project is also initiating one of the biggest civil wars in the Jewish community in thousands of years. It's a pretty big deal. And you know, Sometimes people think it's a little bit intense to speak about it like this, but there are academics who also talk about Ashkenazi treatment of Arab Jews as genocide, you know, with the radiation experiments, with the stealing and kidnapping of the babies, like, you know, there's endless stories and, you know, none of them have been held accountable. So it's still very much an ongoing thing. And I think, you know, the reason why I think it's also so important is that sometimes I get some people who have this narrative of like, oh, well, you know, Zionism is only bad recently, like only in the last 20 years, like Zionism really went into fascism, like in the early days, it was really fine. And I think that that is like a pretty common, like liberal Zionist view that I constantly kind of have to push against and, and bringing these stories and especially highlighting how early Zionist thinkers in their writing like talked about Zionism as a colonial project and they talked about Arabs as a racialized other like it's very explicit in their writing they're not you know trying to hide it at all so to have this narrative that you know Zionism was once this like Jewish liberation movement is just really ignorant of its history and I think that the treatment of different types of Jews like really shows that you know one last thing I will say about that is that I think also you know there's a lot of racism in the American Jewish community towards Arab Jews and I get this a lot you know where American Ashkenazi Jews like blame Arab Jews for the Zionist project which is like this very kind of convoluted <laughs> thinking but basically the claim goes it's like well they're the majority in Israel. So they're the ones who are kind of, you know, voting the most right and all of that. But then it's like, okay, well, you actually look about like, okay, who are largely like having the settlements in the West Bank, it's largely Ashkenazi communities, who are the people in power, especially like militaristic power, and, you know, they're largely Ashkenazi. So I think that that kind of erasure of the racialized politics is really important to highlight, and especially in the American kind of liberal Jewish community that just continues to erase those narratives. Do you have a comment, Michael? No. No, nah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you, you're, you're in Jerusalem right now, right? Yeah. What, what's it like now? Tell us what the ambiance is like. How many Hadars are there in Jerusalem? Is it just you? Are there? Do you have like one friend like you? When we interviewed Miko Pellet for the for the podcast early on, he told us that there are very few anti-Zionist Jews in Israel. Very few. He says they are mocked. They are you know laughed at. They are a joke. And the overwhelming majority of Jewish Israelis are totally fascist. This was kind of the, the image that he painted for us. Nice, pretty picture. <laughs> yeah. So I want to get your views on, I mean, you know, do you have a circle of friends that's similar to <laughs> you? Do you hang out with only Palestinians? I mean, what does your life look like? Please, God. 
Yeah, please let her like let you not be the only person. <laughs> I love this question. Like, do you have friends there? <laughs> oh, but, no, no, but I mean, like, I, it's, 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 hey, we did not did not mean to roast you like that. <laughs> no, it's okay. Boy, like, get some friends. <laughs> look, like, I know when Miko goes to Palestine, like, all his pictures are with like Basim Tamimi in the West Bank and the Bornat family in Bilain, and yeah. he's all over the the West Bank uh, visiting with Palestinian families and. So I, I would understand it would make total sense to me if a lot of your friends were Palestinian, simply because yeah. the politics align and you understand them and they understand you. And and obviously, because we're not anti-Semitic, we are very happy to be friends with anti-Zionist Jews. Or, or do you have this great group of anti-Zionist Israeli friends that are all refuse Nicks? Who knows? You know? <laughs> yeah, a large part of my community here is Palestinian. And one thing I will say about also this anti-Semitic thing, which I think is so interesting because so often I say to like my community, I'm just like, wow, I wish people knew how much like Palestinians actually love Jews. <laughs> like so many of my Palestinian friends are like constantly wanting to learn more about Judaism, like so celebrating my Jewishness. And yeah, so I think that it's always like such an interesting thing for me to like hear these like claims of anti-Semitism and then just like experience this like really deep love for my Jewishness from my Palestinian friends. I definitely have a big group of Palestinian friends. There's also like this community that I'm part of that is like a mixture of Israelis, Palestinians who, you know, do justice work kind of together and do cultural work. There's definitely like an international group of activists. I think that there are you know, I wouldn't say that there's many, but there's definitely groups of anti-Zionist, like Jewish friends here. They're just a lot more low key, like maybe because they don't really have Instagram or something. But, you know, especially ones that kind of do like resistance work in the settlements or in Hebron Hills or things like that. Like there are communities that really do like really awesome solidarity work. They just don't post about it. Sometimes I go back and forth. It's like, okay, should I document this more? But it's just kind of in some ways also just, you know, I think a lot of people feel who have these politics just feel like it's just the responsibility of what you do if you live here. I definitely feel like an outsider in like the larger Israeli community. I mean, I will say that like, it's interesting being, because, you know, I move around in different cities and Jerusalem, I think is, I was just meeting with a friend last night who's from Ramallah and we just were like, he's also originally from Jerusalem and we were just like, you know, Jerusalem is like both the most intense city in the world, but also like the most special and the most holy. And I think that that's something that's like really interesting about Jerusalem is that like, it's so violent and it's so horrifying and there's a lot of really horrible shit that happens there. And somehow there's still like this amazing quality of like holiness and awe and just like the land still vibrates of itself. And I think that there's something really beautiful about that. Because I also have an American passport, I feel like, you know, I have some sort of like privilege and freedom to escape to the States whenever it feels like I need to. And I think a lot of my work is also trying to like connect especially like Palestinian activist communities here on the ground with more American kind of activist communities and also just you know organizations that have more resources because I do think that there are a lot of like really beautiful initiatives that happen here one of the things that I do find is that I think that there is a pretty big like language barrier like you know not a lot of people here know English so you know, if you only know Arabic, then you can't really get to the international community as much as English speakers can. So I think that there's also like, you know, this interesting thing about how to do translation work and, and how to actually like connect internationally with like language gaps. That's definitely something that I see a lot. It's like, okay, like if this was translated into English, like I could really you know, share this more globally. But sometimes it's like the best things are not in English. Going back to the issue of the great trauma that Arab Jews have gone through, one of the things that you have identified previously is the loss of the Arabic language and yeah. the having to assimilate into this European Jewish culture. And so that's something that ostensibly 
going, referring to what you're speaking to now is sad because, you know, you would have been able to communicate with your Palestinian counterparts had it not been for Zionism. Yeah. 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 And do you know what's even more horrible than that? It's like, you have kind of this thing of like Ashkenazi Jews who then have this like fetish or exotification of the Arabic language and then they start learning it and then they can speak it better than you and you're like, God damn it. Like it's only because you went to all these academic institutions and you don't have this trauma and all of a sudden like you're speaking this language that was mo- like, it's just this weird kind of thing that makes me angry. But you know, I was living in a multi-faith house last year and I had a, a Jewish prayer book that is in Hebrew and Arabic. And I remember my housemate was just like really shocked. He was like, wait, like what? Like Jews prayed in Arabic too. And I'm like, Yeah, Arabic was actually a huge part of Judaism for many, many years. I mean, all the way back into the golden age of Spain, it's like some of the greatest Jewish philosophers and commentators were writing in Arabic. And, you know, definitely under Zionism, Arabic kind of, and also, you know, with U.S. imperialism, like Arabic kind of became this terrorist language and everybody's like trying to distance themselves from it. And I think that for me, it's like I... I mean, I love the Arabic language, both because it feels like it's the language of the land, but also because it feels like it's a Jewish language. So, you know, there's, yeah, I'm still working on my Arabic and inshallah in a few years, I'll be fluent, but for now I can, yeah, thank you. I do like, I go to a lot of Arabic speaking events and I can integrate, but I can't, I can't be featured on a podcast just yet. (laughs) Doing some research for this podcast with you, I uncovered the language Judeo-Arabic, which I had not heard about before. Can you speak a little bit of Judeo-Arabic? Arabic has many different flavors to it across different regions and across different communities. You know, it's kind of one language, but based on where you were, what community you were in, there's kind of different versions. So so Jewish community spoke Judeo-Arabic. And I actually remember one of my friends who is a Libyan Jew. She, like her grandmother spoke Arabic, Judeo-Arabic. And she wanted to basically commune with her. So she actually like lived in Jordan for a couple of years. And she studied like intensive Arabic. And then she came to speak with her grandmother. And she realized it's like two totally different Arabic. And she kind of had this like grief in her that she was just like, well, I don't think I could actually revive this language because it's not really being taught anywhere anymore. And there is kind of that erasure of it. And, you know, I saw this little documentary too about how also just like the script has been erased and lost. So so even Hebrew, actually, Hebrew, a lot of Arab Jews, the way that they wrote Hebrew was very close to Arabic. And it was a little bit of a different script than what is now kind of like modern Hebrew in Israel. So what that basically means is that if you find archives and documents from a couple hundred years ago from Europe, you'll probably be able, like academics and, you know, if you're doing all this manuscript work, you'll be able to actually kind of carve out the words because they are very similar to the modern Hebrew style. But if you find the same documents from Iraq or from Syria or from all these other places, you actually can't anymore. Like people can't really recognize that language anymore. So it's not that we just like lost this language. We actually lost this huge like wealth of knowledge too. And and really riches. Like I think that to me, I think that the Middle East in general is just like full of so much riches and wisdom and poetry and, you know, all this beautiful knowledge that the European Settler Colonial Project and Western imperialism really kind of just destroyed the way that all of this Middle Eastern wisdom is seen, you know, not just Jewish communities, I think all communities really from this land, like there's really deep revival work that is needed. And I don't know what it will look like, you know, I kind of do my own personal, like right now I'm learning Makamim, which I'm really excited about, and just Jewish prayer music that is based on Arabic music. But, you know, I remember my teacher who's also a Syrian Jew, he said to me, like, you know, every time a student comes, like, I'm so happy because a couple years ago, I just thought this whole, like, language of music, of Jewish Arab music will just be completely lost because, 
it just no one was investing it nobody was interested everybody kind of forgot about it so like stories like that always make my heart like feel some grief and I always wonder about what the revival projects here are follow up Michael no just thank you so much for that answer (laughs) okay let me see is there anything you want to talk about Hadar that we haven't brought up just checking because we are pretty thorough we know that (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you guys are great. Yeah, I mean, I guess I will say that I think, you know, one of my stories I kind of posted and I was like, okay, who out here who's Palestinian or Mizrahi like would be interested in some sort of like solidarity network? And I got so many positive responses and I'm just really curious about that work and what that work could look like because I really, like for me, I I do feel like it is the key to untangle Zionism especially, you know, first it's kind of like the undoing of the Judaism equals Zionism equation, but also this like undoing this Arab versus Jewish equation too. And I think like once both of those equations are undone, it's like what is really left for Zionism to lean on. So just the genocide stuff, really. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, I think it's also like, I've been really just like, warmed in my heart because I feel like for so long I felt so alone in my own personal struggle and 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 you know kind of organizing how I understand what's happening and all of that and I think you know what I found is that the more I'm just speaking and sometimes it's not even that you don't even have to have like the clear answer in your mind like I think the thing that's so funny to me is like sometimes people message me and they're like well what's your solution then like what is like two states one states and I'm always like, wow, like, we really can't get away from thinking of solutions in terms of states. Like, that is like such a deep mind pattern. Like, maybe there's another solution that's not just like nationalistic, state based. But yeah, but just kind of deconstructing from there and just getting to speak more about personal experience and and building relationship. And, you know, I'm, I'm like, so touched by Palestinian community that care so much about Arab Jewish struggle, you know, that to me is like what solidarity is, is that when we can understand our own pain and our own lineage, but we can also meet someone else's and then together we can meet each other. You know, that's kind of, I think the, the beauty of justice work is in that coming together and that recognition of shared struggle, even if it might look different and really building power in that way, building that collective power that can detopple empires. The people who ask, well, what do you think the solution is? Always think that they've somehow cornered you, that then you're going to be like, aha, ah, or like, ah, I don't know, I don't have a solution. Oh my God, I haven't thought about a solution. And, and that your entire worldview is going to crumble because of that question. Also, they're usually like, faceless accounts that were just made with three yeah. followers. Like, what are you talking yeah. about? Who cares <laughs> yes. what you think? But I think that the really insane thing is that it's so obvious what the solution is not. The solution is not apartheid. The solution is not injustice. The solution is not categorizing people into different categories based on their background and origin and then prescribing them rights on the basis of totally arbitrary qualifications. That's not the solution. So, mm-hmm. you know, you can you can talk about whatever solution you want, but that's not the solution, Right. So let's move past that into something else where people are all equal. How about that? Is that insane? Or am I, you know what I mean? Like for me, it's just so obvious what the solution is. The solution is equality. The solution is enforcing the rights that already exist under international law, including the Palestinian right of return, which by the way, Israel accepted as a condition for its entry into the United Nations. And today we are so far from that. We're we're so far from that, that we are in a place where not only does is that not even part of the conversation anymore? But Israel is basically saying the whole thing is ours, right? Sure, that's all well and good. But have you ever thought about spraying the Holy Land with skunk water? Right. <laughs> the real solution. Yeah. <laughs> the only solution. <laughs> I recently had this experience with the whole Ben and Jerry's decision to stop selling the ice cream in the illegal settlements that once I started posting about the decision and I started getting Zionists flooding my inbox and tagging me in comments, and all they could say was, you hate gays, you are anti-gays, you are anti-LGBT. And I sat there being like, what 
on earth are they talking about? And it dawned on me that the Zionist pamphlet didn't have some sort of a pre-programmed response for how to deal with the Ben and Jerry's decision. Because here we have a major American corporation come out and take a stance against the settlements, which for so many years, now Israel has acted like are totally a part of Israel. They've gone along with this whole thing. The settlements are not illegal anymore. Donald Trump said it, so it must be true. They're absolutely illegal. It's absolutely a violation of international law for Israel to transfer members of its population onto occupied land. And that's never going to go away, no matter how much Israel wants to pretend like it doesn't exist. And with this Ben and Jerry's decision, it was like all of a sudden, the Zionists went into meltdown. They started to glitch and they just started looking at the pamphlet being like, well, ah, what can I say? And all they could throw out at me was I must hate gays. And I was like, well, this is totally not relevant at all. But it's so, so, so true. And this is why we always say Zionists are weak. Zionism is weak. It's an ideology fabricated on nothing and it's rooted in injustice and racial supremacy. And there is no space for that in the world that I think most people want to live in and a world that respects all of humanity. And that's why Zionism has got to go. There's just simply no place for it. And there's especially no place for it in Palestine in the holiest place on earth. Yeah, the only time I feel bad for Zionists is when they have to go off script. You can tell it's tough for them. You know what I mean? Yes. Like they're really, they're not built for that. No, yeah. they're not. That was actually a genius analysis. It, it makes me remember a time when I was talking to a friend and she basically kind of, she's Zionist, and she basically pulls a very similar thing where she was just like, well, what about queer Palestinians? And I was like, I just I couldn't really even understand how that was even related to anything we were talking about. And she was just like, how does Palestine treat queer people? And I was just like. Yeah, what, what about queer this? Palestinians? They're not Zionists What's, either. And how does Israel treat them, right? Yeah. What's yeah, super so. funny about all of the messages that Lara got right after the Ben and Jerry's decision is we had literally just put out an episode about pink washing. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. yeah so With I a queer you Palestinian. Start, so you start realizing that these people are just not even listening to anything you're saying. <laughs> or they're they're not, you know, they're yeah, they're not listening to your podcast. They're not listening even to the words that are coming out of your mouth. And they just have the list and they just kind of run down, you know. And if well, and if I will say air, that they are they are listening to the podcast because I've been clipped and put up many times so they've got somebody watching this into you i say what's up motherfucker <laughs> that's so true remember when they were like report michael shirts are of the palestine yeah. pot yeah, yeah. whoa because I, I said that uh, all colonists should be dealt with by the court or the sword i didn't even mention israelis but they were like yep that's we're us we're colonizers that's us. he's talking about us damn that's so intense i'm so sorry you get so much hate for this you guys are just having real conversations <laughs> it feeds me you know, anyone who does this work is exposing themselves to a certain yeah. type of vitriol. And, but once you get past it, once you sort of realize like, okay, these people are weak. The whole ideology is weak. Everything that they have constructed is weak. Yeah. And you know, you're on the right side of history. Yeah. That's what gives me strength is like knowing I am on the right side of history, knowing that in 50 years or 30 years, or however long it takes, or maybe in five years, however long it takes for the Zionist project to crumble, we're going to look back on it not very kindly, and that's going to be the mainstream consensus, and Zionists are going to have a lot of explaining to do. And yeah. for until now, they've sort of gotten away with it, but they're not going to get away with it ultimately. Yeah. And we don't even have to look into the future. I look into the past. Everybody who I've ever looked up to opposed Zionism, right? <laughs> Malcolm X, Kwame Ture, Dr. Angela Davis, right? They yeah. are all clearly in opposition to Zionism. You know, you see a lot of people who are conditioned as Zionists and then become anti-Zionist. You never see the other way around. You never Bingo. see like anti-Zionists become Zionists because it's just impossible. Because the more so, information... You oh, have, that was brilliant. Yeah, it's a one-way street. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I think it's also interesting because... I think part of the reason why people feel sometimes scared to speak up about Palestine is because they think they will lose friends, which usually happens. Like for me also, like the more that I speak up because I've been, you know, I've been a Jewish educator for many years. So I have 
a lot of people from the Jewish world who follow me. So when I first started speaking up, I definitely got a lot of people being like, wow, I can't believe you're a Jewish educator and you're standing up for Palestinians, <laughs> which, you know, is a crazy statement. But I did get a lot of people who kind of stopped talking to me or unfollowed and all of that. But I think the thing is, is that you just realize that then you get better friends. You know, you get friends that actually align politically and, and you just have to kind of let the people go that don't share the same political values as you. And, and, and then you find new people that do justice work at the end of the day. It's like, you know, it's hard, it's challenging, it's, it's all of the things, but it's also the best community, the community that I've felt the most trust in. And, you know, I think that that's something that's really beautiful. And I, I really wish that everybody could experience how beautiful that is. Um, and I think that does take a little bit of taking risks, you know, to, to actually like live in integrity with your values. 100%. I could not have said it better. I have lost friends. I've been distanced from family. But what I've learned is that the community that I've built is just as strong, if not stronger than biological ties, right? I consider both of you my sisters. The community that I've built in this work it means so much more to me than the people who don't see the vision, right? Not everybody's going to be with you the whole time on your journey. Some people are there for just a small portion and that's okay. It's when you hold on to those relationships that are not feeding you that you do harm to yourself. You stunt your own potential. Yeah. And I have felt myself grow into the person I've always wanted to be in speaking out about Palestine. That was amazing. Wrap it. Let's wrap it. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hadar Cohen, for coming on the Palestine pod. We so appreciate your perspective, your wisdom, everything that you've shared with us. Thank you so much to our listeners for engaging with another episode of the Palestine pod at the Palestine pod on Instagram. All of our sources will be uploaded to www.palestinepod.com. And if you want to send us an email, reach out to us at palestinepod at gmail.com. That has been another episode of the Palestine pod. Thank y'all for listening. Have a great day. Wait, can I just, is it like too dark in here? Should I turn on no, more light? No, we can see you, but no, you can you turn on great. more light. Michael, okay, what's your mis- question about? <laughs> oh, I just want to say you look great. You've got mystique to you. Um, <laughs> Thanks. To those Jews who are still on the apartheid fence, jump in and the water's warm. Should be apartheid wall, no? <laughs> well, you don't, they, they don't say that in the, in the phrase, you know what I mean? You don't say the apartheid yeah. wall in the, I know it's I, just I, that Zionists it call idiom. it, Zionists call it a fence. That's, that's all I'm saying. But some, isn't some place it is a fence though, not a wall. Like, I mean, it's got like barbed wire and like razors everywhere, but sure. We can call it a fence. <laughs> <laughs> okay if if you are if you are sitting on the apartheid wall jump in the water's warm uh, okay the fence one might have worked better um you know look i know i write the jokes <laughs> <laughs>